So, um, first of all, I want to thank uh, the uh, organizers and uh, especially Chef uh, Reinhardt for um, inviting me here. So for me, it's a, a very huge honor uh, to do the um, opening keynote lecture uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, seminar. So um, the title will be, it's about um, um, what I've been working on with a, with a great team for the last 20 years at Puratos. For those who do not know Puratos, um, it's a, a Belgian family-owned company. So um, we have the headquarters in Belgium where I'm based. It's close to Brussels. And uh, we are a pure B2B uh, company. So we are producing and uh, selling, obviously, uh, ingredients for bakery, patis uh, patisserie, and also uh, Belgian chocolate. So to be honest, we are the only true Belgian um, chocolate producer because we still have um, the Belgian families owning the company and so um, it is 100% Belgian. So uh, if you eat uh, once the, the Bel Colade, you can uh, be for sure it's a Belgian chocolate. Okay, so uh, within uh, this company, um, well obviously we don't, we don't have any bakeries. We do have a lot of uh, very good uh, bakers because our mission is to help our partners in the industry and in the bakery industry um, to grow their business as well. And so we invest a lot into um, uh, understanding and so on. And so for the last 20 years, um, I have the, the big luxury to uh, work on sourdoughs. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a food microbiologist and um, I did for 10 years the, the research department and for the last uh, 10 years I'm, I'm uh, in charge of uh, what we call the business unit. So it's the worldwide business of fermentation products for bakery. Okay, so my whole life is, uh, is about uh, fermentation. So whether it is for Paratos or it is after Paratos, then uh, it's just turning from solid bread into liquid bread, which we often call in Belgium uh, beer. Okay, <laughs> so um, um, it's a fantastic world. So let me just um, introduce the, briefly why it is so fantastic. And I want to start with the words of uh, an American uh, writer, so, um, and I think um, uh, that's the main reason uh, why we are so passionate about fermentation. Because he stated, and I, I'm fully uh, behind that statement, is that fermentation might have been a bigger and a better uh, discovery than fire. That's a bold statement, and, um, but I, I truly believe uh, that's true, because if we think a little bit about food, um, the most delicious things that we can enjoy in food are mostly coming from a fermentation, okay? You see a couple of them. I don't know who is a, a wine lover amongst you. It's still early in the morning, but okay, I see some uh, <laughs> who acknowledge that they have an issue. No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> um, but so, again, uh, wine is a fantastic uh, fermentation product. Right? It starts from grapes. And then Mother Nature starts to transform that in, in all the different wines we find around the world. We can continue. You see uh, on the picture as well, um, cheeses, okay? You start from such a simple raw material being milk, and then the natural fermentation will turn all of that in the beautiful world of cheeses, where you can find all the different textures, all the different tastes um, that you that you have in cheeses nowadays. Okay, well, obviously, I already mentioned it, beer. It's another nice example where we, um, we have uh, a beautiful grain fermentation, and I'm also uh, very proud uh, today to be a Belgian because since last week, it's also officially recognized by UNESCO that uh, the beer culture um, is very important uh, in Belgium, so we have we are a very small, tiny, tiny little country, but we do have over a thousand different beers. Um, and um, I, I'm only into the 675 one tasted, so <laughs> I still have a lot to go. But it's a fantastic world. And again, it's a, a very simple raw material, um, like, like malt, barley, ferment, fermented into the, the lovely world of, uh, of beers. And we have all the way from uh, a regular pills all the way to the sour beers that you might know, which is a spontaneous um, acid fermentation. So again, a combination of lactic acid bacteria and wild yeast. 
And that's probably the closest to, uh, uh, to sourdoughs to date. Only we don't bake them, we drink them directly. That's good for the, the gut health. Um, on the other side, well, we have some other examples. I already touched up to uh, chocolate. Obviously, chocolate is one. Um, coffee is another nice example of fermentation. And I can continue probably with a lot more. And the kimchi, the, the olives, the hams. Think about it. Whenever uh, a fermentation in the, is involved, I think it becomes a really, really nice food. Now, obviously, I missed one over here which might be important today. Okay, I guess you know what I'm talking about. Another fantastic fermentation product. Bread. Of course, sometimes I think, and it's one of my uh, biggest frustrations, is we think uh, we take bread for granted. Okay, but I still believe um, for all those years that um, bread is, um, is probably one of the oldest of fermentation products probably one of um, those that really grew with man mankind and with uh, society. And what's even more particular is the only one who can probably unite all of the other fermentation products. With bread, you can eat the ham. With bread, you can eat the chocolate. With bread, you can <laughs> drink your coffee. With bread, you can, and I can continue. And so, um, and a matter of fact, you can enjoy a good loaf of bread at least three times a day. I mean, you can have a, a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner. There is none existing of those uh, beautiful fermentation products like bread. And so that's a bit where, um, where we are on a, on a fight back to bring more um, respect for bread. I think products just like bread, well, they deserve a lot of respect from the industry in general. And I think many other industries, like the wine industry, they already were able to reinvent and to unite and to, uh, to develop a culture around wines. Everybody can talk half an hour about the decent class of wine, trying to think which, uh, which chateau, which year, which grapes, and so on. And that culture of bread, well, that's basically uh, what we are fighting for again. Uh, why, why did this happen? Well, um, I think we lost a little bit the culture of bread due to a couple of facts um, which are happening over the last 100 years, basically. Okay, I just named three of them that I uh, mentioned over here. Well, definitely, there was something like um, uh, the Industrial Revolution, okay? So suddenly food had to be uh, produced, uh, mass production, to be able to feed uh, the suddenly billion of people on the planet Earth. So they all need to, uh, to get food. And, um, and so we see that many um, technologies, they evolved to enable the mass production of food. Um, while by accident, not by accident, by choice, I'm also following a course on traditional milling technologies. So we are going back into, um, into windmills and watermills because in Flanders, that's the Flemish part of Belgium, we still have like uh, 250 um, wind and watermills operational. And I think as well over there, there was this um, industrialization that suddenly all those um, nice mills became obsolete because there was the invention, obviously, of the mass-produced um, Flour. I think the same, the second thing that, um, that put the culture of bread under pressure was obviously um, a French guy initiated, uh, Mr. Louis Pasteur, we might, we might all know him. So there were more scientific insights about fermentation. And suddenly, um, while well, the industry, again, they had to mass produce bread and um, they selected a very performing yeast strain that we still today know all as um, uh, the baker's yeast, okay? So suddenly, baker's yeast enabled to produce bread in two hours, where if you would do it the traditional way, well, you need probably 20, 24 hours. Um, on top of that, it is much more consistent. So you can do it always, every day, um, at the same time. So it allowed suddenly 
um, for the industry to, um, to have mass production of bread because the fermentation was controlled, the flour was controlled, and so we had a little bit of a, a loss of that biodiversity in bread making. Okay, but um, luckily, um, at the end of the day, there is only one deciding about the future of bread, and uh, that is the consumer. And the consumer nowadays um, starts to realize that there are more precious things um, in food. And so, while you already saw a bit in the introductory movie about the sensor bus, we do a lot, although we are not uh, in, in bakeries and we are not a B2C company, what we do uh, a lot is investing in understanding the final customer um, so that we can help uh, the bakeries uh, to produce exactly what the consumer of tomorrow wishes from his bread, okay? It's a study we do every, um, every three years, They're very extensive. It ha it's about thousands of consumers in um, many mega cities, we try to understand exactly what the consumer of tomorrow uh, is searching in his food. And um, if you want to more, um, Alejandro can uh, tell you probably three weeks about all the things uh, that we do around consumer understanding. Um, but at the end, I just try to, we try to conclude it in, uh, in the consumer triangle. And um, you can see it, the most of the consumers today, well, obviously they care again more about uh, their health, which means they care about um, the nutritional aspects of food. And so we see a tendency again uh, uh, towards more balanced and nutritional food than before. So all the refined foods um, are uh, under pressure and we see people going back to a more healthy nutritional food. Now the only thing they don't want to uh, sacrifice is uh, obviously the taste. So many people try to experience with uh, good tasting breads, with good tasting food in general. And um, so that's another trend that we see. And finally, they want fresh food. They want, um, they want to know as well the story, where it's coming from. And all of that, while well, we conclude in this uh, consumer triangle. And so we see that this consumer is evolving and that the trends are evolving. And luckily, uh, we see here as, a, as well many people who are supporting this. And then uh, at a certain moment we said, well, if this is the case, <coughs> let's uh, try to study what would mean um, the future of bread. Okay, for that we took uh, a Danish professor of sociology. She calls herself uh, a futurist. So Anna Marie Dahl, well, she doesn't have a glass ball, eh? don't worry, but she's studying um, evolution, so trends and hypes, making the difference between trends and hypes. And so we um, asked her a very simple question. How do you see the future of bread? And uh, after a couple of months, uh, she came back with a very simple answer. <laughs> Luckily, yes. It's the most expensive answer, but okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it is a, it's a clear one, and that's what we are living for. And she said, well, uh, don't overdo, the future of bread lies in its past. Ah, that's an interesting uh, statement. And we said, uh, so we went into uh, research. We said, okay, what is then the past? And when was the best uh, bread ever? And most of us would think, okay, about the nostalgia of your grandparents. Uh, well, probably the bread with our grandparents was better. Um, unfortunately, this is not always the case. Obviously, if you come to Europe and you have your grandparents, in my case, well, that means it was the time of the, the wars. So I can assure you the bread was not that great at that moment. They were already happy to have bread. So we said, well, then we have to continue to search, probably, um, where we can find the roots of the bread, uh, which is the best bread in the world. And we went back all the way um, until the first uh, written uh, evidence about the best bread in the world. And so we came back to um, 37 before Christ, and it was um, Horace at that moment who was uh, writing uh, quite a lot 
And so in one of his um, writings, he mentioned about um, trips through Italy. It was in the Roman Empire. And so he was mentioning um, a lot about things to do in the Roman Empire. Okay? And at a certain moment, he describes um, a trip going from the south of Italy, which is the Puglia region, all the way to the north. And he said, well, if you're uh, a tourist or somebody else, and you go from the south of Italy to the north, and you pass by uh, Altamura, well, I can assure you, you should take the effort to go and buy a bread at Altamura. Um, because it is probably the best bread in the world. So dated 37 before Christ. And he said, OK, that's, an, uh, that's a nice uh, uh, knowledge. And so we went back to research that. And imagine what, still today, this <coughs> bread is being produced in, um, in Altamura. It is called Pani di Altamura. It has uh, today as well a DOP, uh, which is just like champagne. It's a, a certificate of origin. And why is it so special? Because it's one of those breads they are locally produced um, on hard wheat flour. You know, hard wheat flour normally only used to make pasta and spaghetti and so on. Well, in that region, they use it to make bread. Um, they call it, uh, today, it's like uh, the flour of, uh, of the durum wheat. They call it rimancinata because it has been milled twice. Otherwise, the first thing is you have a simola, then you make pasta out of it. The second time, you make a flour for baking. And this traditional bread, it was um, produced by, uh, by sourdough, obviously, yeah, because uh, baker's yeast, they did not have it at that moment, was not existing yet. Louis Pasteur was by far not born. So every bed, everybody made his own natural yeast. And, um, and so still today, 58 of those bakeries are producing this kind of bread. So it is really worth, uh, like Horace said, now I quote him, to go to Altamura one day and enjoy a lovely loaf of uh, pani di Altamura. And you just eat it with olive oil, beautiful uh, Italian olive oil and a little bit of fried sea salt. But you can take Italian, it doesn't matter. It's fantastic. Okay? And we started to study and to understand, okay, what is it um, that makes bread so special? And we, we, um, we are working together with a quite a renomated um, professor in Bari, who is called uh, Marco Gobetti. He has been working on food fermentation all his life. For the last 20 years, we are working together with him. And so we started um, uh, to study that sourdough. Uh, to understand which microorganisms, which lactic acid bacteria, natural yeast, are living in that uh, sourdough. Secondly, we said, okay, once we understood that, um, well, we, we, we said, okay, in Italy, for those who know a little bit Italy, they have a huge culture of bread making. And almost every region in Italy has his own um, bread. And with his own bread, his own lievito naturale, his, his natural yeast. And so we went into a project with Marco and we said, well, let's study what is the biodiversity in the Italian natural sourdoughs. And so we started off with 17 uh, sourdoughs coming from all over Italy in just crusty breads. Okay? And we started to compare. Uh, we isolated all the lactic acid bacteria, all the yeasts growing in those um, sourdoughs, and that we started to conserve over time. After the 17, a year later, we said, well, why don't we do that the same for um, sweet uh, bakery goods? Because, you know, Italy, for them, uh, if you call uh, uh, patisserie it's, and sweet bakery goods, it's all about uh, panettone, pandoro, colomba, and they have a beautiful variety of, uh, of sweet breads, which are all naturally leavened. Because if you don't do it naturally leavened, well, you will never get that quality that you need in those typical Italian products. And so we started with 17 of those um, sourdoughs being used into uh, sweet leavened doughs. And the journey continued until uh, one day um, I got invited by a, a Syrian baker in Lebanon. And it was a uh, um, in Lebanon, they make these little rusks. It's a very traditional 
um, bakery goods or a dry rusk, and they don't use any baker's yeast over there. They use a traditionally fermented chickpea. So they take chickpeas, they leave it for uh, about eight hours to ferment, and the juice of the chickpea they use to make these rusks, okay? And they can ferment 300 kilo of flour just with one liter of the juice of chickpea. Extremely amazing. And so I got invited by this uh, Syrian uh, baker, and um, he said, well, I want you to, when I'm making my, uh, my cock, it's called cock, uh, when I'm making my cock, I want you to write down everything I'm doing. And you just start and measure and do whatever you have to do so that afterwards I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine, sounds like a deal. And so um, we started off in his bakery. He had, uh, just to give you an impression, uh, he had this, uh, a safe being rebuilt in a proofing chamber, and he had uh, two uh, lamps, traditional lamps, not LEDs, but traditional lamps, and that was the heating, okay? He had a third one for the winter time, and he said, that's my heating. So he didn't have a clue about uh, how warm it was inside, but that was how he did it. To take his water temperature, he could just touch it, and then he knew he was on the right temperature. So it was a very, very hot, uh, hot dough. And we write it down, everything, everything. And so at the end of the day, um, I asked the guy, I said, yeah, but why do you ask me to do all of that? And he said, you know what, I have two sons. And they are, well, um, between 18 and 20 years old. And I tried to teach him uh, bakery. But uh, I can assure you, he said, that um, it's not top of their mind to come on a Saturday evening to play around with my chickpeas, waiting eight hours exactly doing things and double and so on. And um, he said, well, lately they went to one of those uh, big fairs in Europe and they discovered something um, which they think is uh, pretty uh, interesting. And he said they called it the uh, instant dry yeast. And so <laughs> suddenly they were able to combine the best of both worlds because they could go on a Saturday night to the discotheca come in the morning after the discotheca and still make the cock in time. <laughs> but he said, well, you know what? They are a little bit too young to understand the difference today. Um, one day, when they grow up and they are wiser, they will know why I'm doing all of it with chickpeas. But then perhaps, you never know, I will not be there anymore or my bakery will not be there anymore and there is no way to preserve that. And that's the only reason why I invited you, that's when my children are old enough to understand, well, then I can tell them, you know what, there is a guy, a Belgian guy, by the way, at Puratos, who came here, the only one to know down exactly from A till Z, what we were doing at that time, and why the cock was not melting away in my tea at four o'clock because I was using chickpeas, and so on, and so on. And that was such an, such an eye-opener for me, um, because, well, every day, still today, uh, bakeries are stopping, unfortunately, around the globe. And it's not even that much about the bakery stopping, but every time that you want to have one of those traditional bakeries stopping, the mother dough uh, dies. And the diversity goes down still uh, as we are speaking. And so that's um, basically where we took the challenge. We said, well, if we are that strong about the future of bread lies in its past, well, we better protect what is still existing. And so that's where we started, um, I have to admit, after a couple of beers, with the idea of let's start uh, a heritage library. Let's find those people still making sourdough today, um, having a long family tradition, and let's start to uh, identify them. Let's start to isolate the strains. Let's start to understand what is happening, and let's start to protect it for the future. Because that's the only way that uh, if we protect the knowledge, that's the way we can share it later on. And I think that's the way, I'm still convinced, that's the way that the bakery industry might come up uh, to defend and to get that respect for uh, such a beautiful bread, as, uh, uh, such a beautiful product as bread. And so that is um, where we started our uh, sourdough heritage library. So today, we have, in the meantime, 93 sourdoughs in that library from, um, I think, 15 countries in the meantime. 
And every day we try to uh, work on protecting that biodiversity of sourdoughs, okay? We allow more or less 20 sourdoughs to enter this library uh, per year because unfortunately, well, you need to maintain them. If we, we have two systems, we have the fresh sourdoughs that we maintain. So every year we get a bag of flour from the original baker because the sourdough remains uh, the property of the bakery. So the only contribution we ask is send us a bag of your flour so we can keep uh, the mother dough going. On the other hand, it takes us with Gobetti more or less three months to isolate all the sourdough bacteria and the yeast separate. And these ones we keep um, in four copies at minus 80 degrees Celsius. So this means in little vials because this is the real, the true conservation for the long term. We know which uh, strains are in there and we can always start up again um, if needed from that bank. We have four copies, so one, uh, three in Belgium and one in uh, Gobetti's place in Bari. So the probability that the electricity goes down on the four places probably is uh, larger than the probability that the planet doesn't exist anymore. So I think we are uh, well protected for the future. And we continue to grow them. And in the meantime, we have 93. So uh, two of my colleagues are refreshing that uh, now and then. It takes them about uh, four full days to refresh. Okay, I don't know how many are making one sourdough. Probably a lot of you, no? You can raise your hand. One sourdough? Oh, beautiful. Two sourdoughs? Even better. Three sourdoughs? Four? 93? <laughs> <laughs> so I have the most luckiest um, colleague, uh, Karel de Smet. Some of, know, some of you know them, uh, him, and uh, he's uh, the lucky man having uh, so 94 mothers. Eh? I always tell him his, his own and then 93 in his library and growing. So um, you know how precious one mother is, so uh, you know how, how precious 94 can be. Eh? Um, and for us, it serves as, um, just watch a little bit my time before I get completely out. Um, it serves for us, um, well, first of all, it's a contribution to the community of, of sourdough lovers, uh, of, of passionate people who are busy with sourdoughs. Secondly, obviously, it, um, it helps us in understanding. It's about knowledge, uh, because we as uh, Paratos, we are also producing uh, natural sourdoughs. We also need to understand how to maintain sourdoughs, how to keep that uh, microbiology under control and so on. So by having so many sourdoughs analyzed, well, obviously you, uh, you start to, to understand better. Um, and then what's also nice about it is that behind every bread, there is a story. I think people, they also like when the consumer wants to know a, a little story. It's always nice. And we are so fortunate with bread because bread has is, is been out there for so long that it's embedded in, in so many things. And so you have uh, the most fantastic uh, bread stories behind sourdoughs because sourdoughs is always. And so we have now, um, you can do a virtual tour into this library. So later there is a table outside and uh, David can guide you around. And so that's the only way that you can actually open a fridge, because if you're in Sankvit, you cannot even do that. But the online and the virtual tour, you can, you can go in the fridge and you can click on the individual sourdoughs. And behind that, there is often a movie about, about the bread behind that sourdough. Okay? And so we are continuously building um, on that library to, um, to let it grow over time. Now I told you we have, uh, the last one perhaps, we just uh, are adding, that's pretty new, we are adding the oldest uh, Japanese uh, sourdough. So it is about 150 years in a, in a Japanese family. Uh, and it's called, the bakery is called uh, Kimuraya. And in Japan they have a very long tradition then of uh, fermenting um, rice based. So they call it sakedane, and so it's a rice based uh, sourdough that they use in, in Kashpan and, and in other. And so this lady, uh, lady um, was um, willing to, to add as well this sourdough to the library. We have some fantastic ones from China as well. 
because although we might think that the Chinese are mainly rice eaters, the whole north of China, they eat steam buns. You know, these little steamed buns. They eat about 709 million a day. Okay, a day. So, and traditionally, those buns, they were the steam buns, they're also fermented uh, with a traditional sourdough. Some of them, again, being very, very old. So today we work together with the University of Wuxi, where they have uh, been doing a whole study about traditional Chinese sourdoughs to make steam bun. A fantastic world, new sourdough strains discovered, and like that we continue. We have the Richmond Club sourdoughs, and by accident we, we saw that um, the sourdough of the Richmond Club of Austria had the same uh, wild yeast strains as we have in um, a birote sourdough coming from Guadalajara in Mexico. Probably we are still researching, but probably they are both made above 1,500 1, meters above sea level. Does that influence the composition? Probably. And so more and more insights we are um, having about traditionally fermented sourdoughs, and we continue to build with new uh, research uh, that we are performing as well in the coming months we will continue to add. Now, 93, that's a fair nice number, I would say, but how many sourdoughs do you think there are in the world? Thousands? We don't know. Potentially everybody can make a sourdough. It has a good reason to make a sourdough. So um, in this physical library, we can fit probably, if all goes well, up to 500 perhaps even 1,000 if we make little jars instead of bigger jars. But still, it's, it's pretty limited, and we don't have really a clue of all the sourdoughs around the world, because we are, most of the time, we get in contact with somebody, we are said, yeah, you should go there and collect his sourdough because, and, and that's the way we work, but we wanted to understand what is the potential, what is out there, who is doing sourdough, why is he doing sourdough? And so last year, um, well, we started a new adventure. We call it the quest for sourdough. So you can uh, go online and for everybody, and I would really, really advise you to do it. If you're a sourdough lover and you make your own sourdough or sourdoughs, uh, please go and visit this website. It's an open website. And all the dots you see over there um, are people making sourdough. And on the website, you have to explain a little bit. You have to give your a child a name, so they all get a name. So it becomes a bit more personal, although it's online. Secondly, uh, you have to explain the reasons why you are making sourdough and what's so typical about your sourdough. Because one thing is sure, everybody making a sourdough, his sourdough is probably the best. So we want to know why it is the best. And, um, and we have very nice, you can see we have uh, many, many in the, in the United States, but growing in uh, South America, Australia, uh, even one guy in India contacted Karl to ask if he could register because it was a bit atypical. And so Karl asked, uh, yeah, but why? And he started from green coffee bean. We said, yeah, we love it. Just, just register. Say why you do it, how you do it. And everybody can describe very briefly how it tastes like, uh, what's so special about the sourdough, and then some pictures, how the sourdough looks like, and which kind of bakery items he is making. And so it goes from... Um, very uh, homemakers, passionate homemakers, because they are obviously not limited by anything, and they can be as creative as they can be. And, uh, and so we try to capture all of that in an open forum so that everybody can enjoy it, okay? And, um, and we continue for our quest for sourdough um, in the future. We will also work, we are working on um, opening La Maison du Levin, we, uh, yeah, it's French because in, in Belgium we, t we talk a little bit of French as well. And, um, and Levin is often also a more uh, smooth way to talk about sourdough because still there is a, a very uh, misconception that sourdough should only deliver sour breads. So that's why we often tend to go to other languages like Levin in French or the best probably is Masa Madre in Spanish. It's the mother dough. It's the, the dough that everything starts from. Uh, the Italians, they still keep it to lievito naturale, so the natural yeast. Um, and all of that, well, we continue 
uh, to grow in this quest, and we will have this La Maison du Levin, so it will be an exposition about the history of sourdough, the components of sourdough, but also a, a, a future look on how we see sourdough in bread making. I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, then, just a couple of words more about uh, what we do with sourdoughs, because obviously um, we also make a, a living out of it. And so for the last 20 years, well, we believe that sourdough um, has such a huge potential that you can make from every bread a signature bread, okay? And that's through natural fermentation. Why this? Because um, uh, we got a little bit inspired by the French making wine. You know, all the chateaus in Bordeaux, they are not one grape. There are at least three grapes, eh? the, the Cabernet Sauvignon, the Cabernet Franc, and the Merlot. And in fact, the one who really knows his wine is the one who assembles it in such a way that it represents his identity. And I like this, this idea that um, you, can, you can, with yourself, with some natural components or the three grapes, you can compose all the Bordeaux of France. And this idea we try to apply as well in bread making. So at Puratos, we have different technologies to make sourdoughs. Obviously, we always start from the basics. This is a fermentation of flour and water with lactic acid bacteria and yeasts. And we give it different fermentations. Uh, but at the end, we can also stabilize it in different ways. So we can, we do uh, make powders out of it, just like you make milk powder out of milk. What you do is you prolong the shelf life. You just extract the water, you don't change anything. And that's why you have a milk powder is in fact to prolong the shelf life of milk. You don't change uh, milk uh, chemically by doing that. And so we applied many of those dairy uh, technologies on sourdoughs. So we can just spray dry it to keep the fruity notes, but we can also drum dry it and then it will become more toasted and more darker. And all of these sourdoughs um, from the, the fresh and living sourdoughs up to um, the dry ones, the toasted one and so on, it becomes for us a toolkit for the baker. So the baker is still there to add his personal touch to it and it can be in combination with a house sourdough. Obviously we will not convince people making sourdough to stop making sourdough, it, that would be a pity. But what we do is we, we try to advise how to build on with uh, different top notes to make each and every bread uh, different. Okay, so that every bread gets, uh, gets its own personality. And that's why I often say, well, um, you know, my, from my mother's family, they were more brewers. From my dad's family, they were more bakers. Luckily, I never had to choose between both of them. So I just became a brewer of sourdough. And now I'm just the, uh, we are just making the liquid sourdoughs uh, for baking. And so, um, and that's more and more uh, where I believe in is that um, um, sourdough brewing I will call it for once, um, has a, a nice advantage of being able to give to each bread a different personality and a different way of, uh, of working together with sourdoughs. And I think uh, together with the creative bakers, we are uh, working together and uh, often one plus one makes more than two. And in this case, well, uh, uh, we are working uh, in designing sourdoughs in designing natural fermented products for bread making for the future. Okay, I will uh, finish more or less here. And um, all of that we have centralized in, uh, in one innovation center back in, uh, in Belgium, uh, in St. Vit. For those who don't know, it's a bit, uh, it's close to Germany and uh, Luxembourg. And we are in a fantastic building where we host the sourdough library, where you can come and visit. Um, everybody is welcome if you're over in Europe. Uh, just give, uh, give us a call and we try to organize something. Um, over there we have also uh, pilot uh, bakeries. So we do work a lot together in personalized workshops to design breads uh, with, with special sourdoughs. And uh, we have also seminars. So now and then, um, not to this extent, we also organize seminars about natural fermentation in bread making. Okay, that was... It's Thank you, nice. Stefan. And can you do me a favor, Stefan, and would you introduce, uh, could you introduce David to the, to the group? Could you, could you, could you 
uh, yeah, introduce, just tell them who Bidema, ah. David. Yeah. Okay, so um, we, have, we have different uh, production units of sourdough, of which we are very uh, lucky to have one as well in the United States. And so here we will, we are in the, um, in the being as we talk, in investing into a large facilities to produce active living sourdoughs next to uh, pasteurized sourdoughs. And so David is um, uh, the business developer for all the sourdough products for Puratos here in the, in the States and in Northern America, so from Mexico, Canada, so a huge. Yeah, market. and David, uh, David Deblaoui, thank you. Uh, he's really the one who brought Puratos and Johnson & Wales together for the, the symposium, and we've been working closely to formulate the, the uh, speakers list and everything else, so I want to thank you, and, and you'll get a chance to talk to him out at the table and as he explains more about the, the life. Because afterwards I disappear and he has to answer all the questions. <laughs> so um, now uh, we tried to, uh, I, I ran a little bit over on the intro, so I want to give a, a little bit of time for Q&A, but to also keep us on schedule. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. If anybody has them, I will bring the mic to you because we want to try to capture the, the questions as well as the answers for the live stream. Does anybody have any questions for Stefan as we continue on? Yes. Uh, I was just very curious if the if you've tested the sourdoughs after you've been feeding them for like a year or so, if they've changed composition. Yeah. So I, I told you every year we add 20, but we also have four that uh, Professor Gobetti comes and collect at random. So he takes four out of the collection and he redoes all the analysis. And then we compare it to the original strains. And so far it's, it's okay, touch wood. So far we can do it, but we have... Um, it's a special setup, you should once come with. So we have many uh, different uh, mixing bowls which are sterilized in between, and the process of Gobetti has been optimized. The process of refreshing has been optimized by Gobetti to be sure that, okay, we can preserve. Again, in the, in the very worst case, we can always grab back the original strain. So that's always our backup system, and that's also the backup system for our customers who donate it. If something would happen in their bakery, which can happen, they are the only ones to come back and collect their original sourdoughs. We will make it for them. So they all have a number with the key of the sourdough library, and they can come uh, with their number and their key, and they will get back their original mother dough. One more question, yes. So isn't it true that uh, Gobetti found uh, Bacillus San Francisco in Italy as well? So oh, yeah. There was, there was some cases, so it's kind of interesting when we talk about yeah. San Francisco sourdough, it actually occurs around the world. In it's, it's actually the most common lactic acid bacteria uh, in sourdoughs. Um, it also depends, again, out of the studies, I can elaborate quite a long time, but out of the studies, it appears also that um, San Franciscansis will come up if you do some kind of refreshments. Very fast and relatively cold refreshment will always promote San Francisco's uh, San Franciscansis over time. So we know that, but it's the most common one, and probably until so far, the only one never found back into the, the human body. So he's really linked to sourdough making. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, one more question, and then we'll and then we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. Um, just a question: um, Is it safe to say that? Yeast has a terroir. Uh, a terroir, that's terroir that it just belongs to some region yes. or so. That as, as I told you, in, in, independently, well, obviously, it, it depends how far you will go in the genetic analysis, probably. But if you stay to the families, um, as I told you, we independently we found two strains, uh, like I told you, the total, um, one of the, the wild yeast back in Switzerland and in Mexico, and um, it might be that it's because of the altitude, because of the terroir, that you will find them back. Probably it, if we do more and more analysis. Until now, unfortunately, the most dominant strain is always uh, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so the, the baker's yeast uh, family. But even in there, I think we should go deeper in uh, analytics to see which strains is appearing where. But most of, fine, most of the time, you, you can already see some, um, it's, it's, it's broader than terroir. It's a little bit like with the San Franciscans. It depends on how you cultivate your sourdough, 
and then under some conditions, some strains survive better. It's always a bit the survival of the fittest. And so we know that in some cases, Saccharomyces cannot survive and that a natural yeast will take over from another family. So terroir is probably important, yes. Stefan, thank you very much for getting us off and running in this uh, symposium. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you'll have a chance to continue to interact throughout. <laughs>